So I was asked to give a historical perspective on our understanding of uh, compulsive sexual behavior or whatever we're calling it. And I, I traced the development of different terminology and, uh, and conceptualizations up to the present time. Um, and I think that that was really appreciated by the audience to really have that uh, historical perspective because uh, not everybody understands why we're sort of in such disagreement and uh, and dispute and uh, particularly the you know the emergence of the whole sex addiction movement and uh, I tried to put that in in all of, well all of the con uh, concepts in context of where they really emerged and came from. So that was my main main goal is really giving that historical perspective. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Um, so what did you want the participants to walk away with? What kind of information? Uh, I, I wanted them to understand what those terms really meant and that terminology is very important, um, that they need to really through uh, their model of we are supposedly treating and that they should use terminology that is consistent with their model and that they should inform their patients um, you know, what they, how they view this and how they are tr treating it because there is no agree agreement on the terminology, what causes it, uh, nor there is an accepted or agreed upon treatment. And so in the absence of that, I think it's really important that people think it through, look at all the different viewpoints, decide for themselves and be able to are really articulate that clearly to the patients that they treat. So you described the terminology from a historical perspective and you, it sounds like you're hoping with giving that knowledge and that information to the participants that they can have a better idea of what they're actually teaching their clients and what they're actually using. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Okay. I certainly advocated that um, that they should understand that um, this phenomena is usually um, caused by many different factors. And these different models oftentimes are just describing a subset of the population and then unfortunately generalizing that to the broader population and i think it's very important for them to really take a look at an individual uh, and try to understand what is really causing their um th their behavior and um in the context of that and uh what may be underlying that uh, uh that problem and um, so <clears throat> that would mean you know using different uh, different uh, therapeutic approaches depending upon the, the nature of the problem um, uh, so I was also really trying to illustrate the the complexity the multifaceted nature of how people get to this state and that one term does not um, and there's really a problem with with the terms that we have because they all sort of imply some underlying mechanism which only describes a piece of the puzzle so you're talking about all the terms not only sex yes. addiction, but yeah. out of control sexual behavior and yes sexual behavior you're talking about yes. all of them have kind of this yes um, yeah yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really kind of understanding the bigger, a bigger grasp on it and understanding kind of where it came from and what we're actually doing is helpful. Mm -hmm. Sounds okay. good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you want um, people who weren't at the ASEC Summer Institute and they really wanted to be there? Is there anything else that you want 
them to know? Um, I think that they should, uh, you know, just read carefully the, the literature. Um, I sometimes I'm impressed with uh, people, you know, seem to glean what they think is uh, people different, different people are really sane, and they really haven't read the, the literature very well. And they should really um, educate themselves with uh, what has really been written, what people are really saying, and um, uh, and so, and not just try to glean it from going to a workshop or whatever. Is to really kind of study the literature. Um, how do you think the dialogue might change after this institute? Hmm. Well, um, I, I, uh, the, it was an amazing uh, institute with uh, the, the faculty that were represented them were some of the very well-known people in, in the field. Mm -hmm. Although I would say that, um, you know, that, that there was no voice of, the, of someone from the sex addiction uh, field. It really was an institute that was really searching for an alternative um, approach, and um, and that's fine. Um, but uh, I think that uh, we need to. And I also shared with them how the whole field seemed to get off track. In early days, we had regular dialogue between sexologists and people who were adhering to this sexual emerging sexual addiction concept. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that um, we had five national conferences uh, that brought uh, people with different views together, and um, and so it was a it was a rich dialogue. And then, unfortunately, the um, the sexual addiction industry sort of took over that um, that conference, and it really became more um, uh, like-minded people uh, coming together to share their their thoughts. And um, so, uh, I there. I think that uh, people need to really kind of appreciate uh, all the different views. And, um, you know, and in some ways, while I'm an outspoken critic of the sexual addiction concept, um, some people sort of demonize some of the people that are involved in it and really don't necessarily understand or appreciate where they are coming from or what they really are saying. And uh, I would hope that there would be a, you know, a vehicle for um, more, more dialogue and more uh, cross-fertilization. Um, but we really need to have more, I think this whole field has been <clears throat> very much driven by clinical observation and anecdotes and very little systematic research uh, testing some of these models. Um, and uh, of course the problem is that there hasn't been funding available, uh, you know, without... I, yeah, so you're saying the whole sex addiction right. field is driven by anecdotes and what you're, keep on going, what you were saying? Even people in, in, in outside of the sex yeah. addiction field, you know, all we have is a lot of our own clinical observation right. and uh, models that we sort of put forth. And there's really not a lot of uh, uh, really good data um, because there hasn't been funding to really do that. Yeah. Yeah. That seems like a big point is just the funding that's available. Yeah. Um, was there any personal value that you took away as being one of the faculty member of the Institute? <clears throat> it was, it was, um, it was a very, uh, 
um, I was very moved by the uh, meeting. Uh, it was a great group of people, uh, and they were really very um, energetic and about uh, really learning more about the and uh, so really gratifying to to see a lot of young professionals really take this issue very seriously and really try to um, learn as much as they could and uh, with an open with an open mind. So it was uh, uh, it was I was sorry that I couldn't stay for the whole thing because I think it would have been amazing to watch. I was at the beginning and I could kind of see where this was going to go. And I was, I knew, I just had a feeling it was going to be amazing. And um, I'm not sure where it ended up, but uh, maybe some of the people that you're interviewing that were there at the end can really share more of that. But it was a great beginning, a great start uh, to the Institute. And uh, it was very exciting. I was very proud that ASAC was taking this issue on uh, in this way. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you would like to talk about or speak about in terms of what um, what was taught there and, and about this uh, issue? Um, I think one thing that was really very striking is is uh, how some people who were trained in the sex addiction model um, you know described almost being you know traumatized by uh, well they had oftentimes gone through treatment yeah. in that model mm -hmm. and then training and the um, the amount of of, um, of guilt that they seem to have about how they may have passed on some of those uh, things to their own clients mm -hmm. and how they were really in, 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 in a grieving process. Sure. That was very striking. Um, and obviously that that's not representative of everybody that has gone through there, but uh, this, this seemed to be a vehicle for them to um, transition, you know, out of that very, prescribed sort of way of thinking about this problem and uh, and their own recovery to a much more um, sex positive uh, and sexual health focus yeah and, I mean, um, that's like it's something that we just keep on hearing that a lot of the sex addiction therapists have gone through their own treatment as a sex addict. And so you're saying that a lot of CSAT sex addiction therapists came to this institute and they were grieving their own process in terms of going through the treatment as a sex addict and then teaching and passing on some of those same principles to their clients instead of a sex positive or a sexual health model. Yeah, that was, that was, very, uh, that was very striking. Yeah, it was a great experience.